Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so I'm technical director at HKS, so forgive me, this is going to be quite technical. Um, uh, I discovered Passive House about 10 years ago, um, and the content of this presentation is based on a Passive House certified school that we completed in 2012. <coughs> As already uh, been said, global warming is compelling evidence of climate change now. And buildings are responsible for 50% of carbon emissions in the UK. And that 50%, I've based it on manufacturing, construction, uh, the running of the buildings, maintenance, and I've, in I've included something towards generation of the energy to serve that building. So that, that's a conservative estimate. Can everybody hear me, by the way? Yeah. Um, there's... There's another aspect to this, which is the national energy security. Um, the UK and their wisdom uh, from the Kyoto Agreement decided to decarbonise energy. So they, they went from coal-fired power stations to gas-fired power stations. Uh, it, um, essentially what that did was it used all of our North Sea gas reserves to generate electricity not terribly bright. Now we import gas from Norway who are basically stockpiling their North Sea, uh, North sea gas. Uh, so instead of looking at nuclear generation, fracking, etc., shouldn't we be making our buildings more efficient? It's something we should have been doing 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, fuel poverty, which originally applied to countries that couldn't couldn't, didn't have access to their own fuel is now being applied to uh, the residents, the, the energy users. Um, and, and a reduction of 90% conservative estimates of energy by adopting something like Passive House uh, benefits the occupiers in terms of cost, but also national uh, interests in terms of energy demand. So an exercise I did in 2012, um, there is a website where you can download the display energy data for all of the public buildings in the UK. So there's some 40,000 buildings. And from that, um, I said it was technical director, so this is a bit geeky, but um, I calculated based on 2012 tariffs that we were spending 4.3 billion pounds a year on energy. If all of those buildings were at a passive house standard, and this is based on the passive house school that we delivered, the, save, the annual saving would be 3.4 billion. So this first slide is really just about uh, heat demand. And this is the bit where the architect can make the biggest difference. Um, and I'll make reference to PHPP, which is Passive House Planning Package, um, which sounds a lot more pompous than it is. It's basically an Excel document that has all of the formulae in. So as you input your data, it starts to calculate out what the energy is. And it's a very accurate energy prediction tool. So in terms of the envelope, form factor is important. It's kind of obvious, but obviously the more, um, the more efficient the form is, you don't have too many ins and outs and uh, single, all single story buildings, um, that, that helps to make it more efficient. Uh, orientation, obviously, glazing. Uh, measuring the envelope areas, external volumes, internal volumes, the ventilation, because you're going to design an airtight building, so you have to have mechanical ventilation. Uh, shading and building geometry, uh, which includes topography, boundary conditions, etc. So if you're surrounded by tall buildings, then there is a, an element of shading factor to take into that. The U-values 
which have to be calculated in the PHPP. Uh, thermal bridging, which you should avoid, but inevitably there's going to be some thermal bridging, and air tightness. So form factor um, is the ratio of envelope to treated floor area. That is like net floor area, but um, it excludes all internal partitions. And ideally, the ratio should be between two and three. The nearer two, the easier it is to get to achieve U values of 0.15. Once you creep up to three and beyond, your U values are going to have to be that much better because you're trying to make the building work that much harder to conserve energy. Um, and the typical experience in the UK is that U values tend to be around 0.1 rather than 0.15, which is the, the minimum for passive house. And um, the conflict that you have is that the client's brief, particularly on a primary school, is that essentially they want, they want all of their classrooms to be at ground floor level. On a three form entry school uh, with a, an autistic spectrum unit on the same site, uh, that isn't possible. But um, it, it kind of broke the rules in terms of um, efficient form factor. So we were, our form factor was working out about 2.8. But you could still make it work. It just meant that you had to have a lot better U values. Um, optimizing glazing uh, and living spaces to southerly facades, that works fine for housing, um, um, particularly small buildings. But for schools, um, it's probably less of an issue because you've got a lot of little heat generators running around in that school. And we were designing a school for 630 pupils and staff. So uh, in terms of um, optimizing the glazing, it was less of an issue. But the biggest issue was overheating. Um, in terms of glazing, the passive house standard is it has to be triple glazed. And that is because the internal temperature of the glass must never fall below 19 degrees C, no matter what the temperature is outside. Um, and generally, with, you would tend to find with passive house uh, windows, they're highly engineered components. Uh, double and sometimes triple sealed but the glass is so much more efficient than the frames so optimize the glass reduce the amount of frames don't have lots of transom and mullions in there because that's just going to make life hell <coughs> the g factor of the glass is as important as the u value and contrary to what some mep engineers would tell you um, you really want to you've got to strike a balance between the U value and the G value. And 0 0.6, 0 0.6 for both is about, about right. I mean, you can get glass down to a U value of 0 0.2, but you know, that's, there's no need for that. But similarly, don't, don't try and reduce the G value because of solar gain, because you're actually working against yourself. You're using that solar energy to heat the building. I mean, that's, yeah, that's the best example. That, and this has been the tradition for the last 50, 60 years, is we put the radiators under the windows because of the huge downdraft that we get off the glazing. Um, so, yeah, go for better windows and reduce the amount of radiators. Um, in terms of measuring the envelope, areas it's always measured to the outside face of the thermal element so that is the outside face of the insulation if that if that indeed is the uh, is the outside face and if you've got a ventilated cavity anything beyond the ventilated cavity and anything beyond cannot be incorporated into the u-value calculation um, 
measuring the internal volume is measured to the face of the air barrier line. But also, it should be noted that uh, all internal partitions and linings are to be excluded. So that makes it slightly trickier when you come to work uh, to get your air tightness. And external volume, we've already covered that. Uh, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. Um, don't believe anybody that says you can build a school purely um, with natural ventilation. Because unless you've got dual aspect classrooms with windows on both sides of the rooms and you exclude all still days, you just aren't going to get the ventilation you need. Um, so we had a passive house mechanical ventilation uh, systems have to be by minimum 70% efficient and they have to be certified, i.e. the Passive House Institute have to see the proof that they can achieve that efficiency. Now you can get mechanical ventilation heat recovery units that are 80 and 90% efficient. So they run on very low energy but they're moving air all the time but they're recovering the heat. <coughs> On the school, <coughs> we had summer bypass fitted to the, uh, the MBHR so that in the summer we, we didn't really need that heat recovery. So it just um, it automatically turns off the heat recovery. <coughs> and also we had them linked to CO2 sensors in every classroom so that we could make sure that CO2 levels uh, were kept to a reasonable level. Um, building geometry, which I've touched on before, I mean, you c in the PHPP, you have to calculate all of the reveals, uh, building returns, overhangs, and as I said before, boundary conditions, site topography, trees, uh, whether it's permanent or temporary shading in the summer. And the U values, um, they're relatively easy to use in PHPP, but they must be calculated in the PHPP. Don't accept what the manufacturers might tell you it can, achi it can achieve in terms of U values. Um, and they tend to be uh, hopelessly over-optimistic because invariably they include the ventilated cavities. And then we come to thermal bridging, which is a whole science in itself. If, if you can, avoid them. Uh, but where you need them, then you have, to, you have to account for those. Some are more simpler than others to do. Um, on this particular school, we used SIPs, which is structural insulated panels, um, uh, timber insulated panels. But we had to calculate um, the amount of solid timber where we didn't have insulation and, and work uh, basically discount uh, the amount of thermal bridging and it can be as much as 20%. So early on in the project, at its scheme design stage, it's probably sensible to assume something like a 20% thermal bridge where you've got solid timber. Uh, yeah, I've already talked about that. Um, I mean, it was, made, it was made particularly complicated on this project because we were on the site of an old quarry. So we had piled foundations. So we had, we had big thermal bridges where we had structural steel actually going through to the pile foundations, um, which takes a bit of uh, sorting out. Windows and door elements uh, weren't, weren't so difficult for us, but the important thing is to locate them centrally within the thermal element. Don't push them out the front or push them right at the back. Uh, air tightness, and this is the one that scared the life out of the contractor, um, is, is probably one of the biggest challenges from a buildability point of view. Um, and because we were using SIPs, it meant there were less interfaces, so for them it was le there was less risk. 
slightly higher cost in terms of uh, having to order the, the units earlier, but in the end, they saw a huge benefit in going down that route. Um, the European standard is measured in air changes. In the UK, it's cubic meters per square meter per hour. And on this particular school, we did three tests. The final tests, um, we achieved uh, 0.25 air changes, which works out at about half a cubic meter per square meter per hour. So that's 20 times better than what building regulations state as a minimum. And probably this is the um, this is the one that sometimes confuses people, and it's primary energy demand, um, and it must be less than 120 kilowatt hours per square meter per hour. But that is at source; that's not what comes through the meter. So, um, in terms of generation and distribution losses, it can be quite significant, particularly on electricity, as much as 40 to 50 percent. So, a, P, a primary energy target figure of 120 kilowatt hours per square meter actually equates to a figure of 65 kilowatt hours per square meter through the meter for a typical gas electric building. In terms of renewables, um, <coughs> solar thermal would help your PHPP calculations because you're going to use that, um, the heat to heat domestic hot water and perhaps a, a wet heating system if you've got it. Photovoltaics have absolutely no effect on the calculations for the PHPP. However, now that Passive House have adopted um, zero energy buildings, you can, you can use that to offset the amount of energy it's going to use. But if you're only using 10% of the energy that a standard building would use, then that's not so difficult to do. In terms of forms of construction, there were five, five schools all built, all completed in 2012 of varying construction. Uh, one was heavyweight, one was precast concrete. Um, the others were timber, some were simple timber frame, ours was SIPs. Um, and the simpler you can make the air tightness detailing, the better for the contractor and the more likely you are to achieve um, the air tightness requirements that you need. Um, in terms of in terms of the the benefits of heavyweight is that thermal mass is looked on as a good thing, which is okay for build, big buildings. I would say for housing, there's less benefit in having thermal mass because you, you generally want to feel the heat uh, relatively quickly. And, um, and thermal mass, you know, if it cools down, it takes a long time to heat it back up, so, but, uh, yeah. Again, you can apply it to both heavyweight and lightweight construction. <laughs>